you can have all the, you know, the, this passion, and you actually have an understanding, but what's your energy level? So are you sacrificing and saying, well, C is okay, B is okay, or are you committed and bringing all the energy you can every day to every class? Because that stuff's contagious, and that's the stuff that carries on. So I, listen, I've never been, I, I was never a great student. I struggled, man, to get through college. Mother made me get an accounting thing. Hey, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, you can't, you know, you go to a restaurant, you don't order what we can eat at home. You go to college, you don't learn what you can learn at home. You can be teaching promotion and marketing. You don't need to go to school for that. I'm not letting you go to school for that. You go to accounting, you can't teach that anymore. Besides, anybody who owns a company, well, they're an accountant or a lawyer, and that's what you should be, an accountant or a lawyer anyway. You know, Jewish home, Jewish mother, you know. You're an accountant, you're a lawyer, or you're, you're disowned. So... <laughs> Energy level, though, back to that, you know, when you look at commitment, you look, commitment leads to passion. Having an understanding is the first step towards making a commitment. You know, you meet a girl, you meet a guy, you know, she wants you to move in, she wants to see you every night. You're not grooving on that understanding, you're not going to really get to a commitment, you're certainly not going to be passionate about it. But if you meet somebody and say, listen, let's hang out like once a week. You know, we can have this really great relationship. We're just going to hang out once a week and see you on Friday night. Other than that, I'm committed to studying and doing my work, whatever else. All right, that sounds good. I'm, I'm getting it. Now, you, now you're ready. You have an understanding. You're ready to make that commitment because you can agree on the understanding. Before you know it, that's all working out. You'll get real passionate about it if you lead to something. So I think it's really, really important to understand the dynamics of that. But then you also have to understand, even though it may be one night a week, and even though you may think it's just that class, the energy you bring every day will dictate the level of your commitment. There are levels of commitment. There are levels of passion. And the levels of, of those two things will lead you to the level of your success. And what kind of energy you put towards that is critical. You know, value proposition, back to that for one second, just with my wife for a minute. You know, I met my wife when I was 17, summer camp. I was poor as hell, so I went to this camp for underprivileged kids. My wife. They wanted to kind of ground her a little bit. She comes from a little bit on the other side of the track, so you know they wanted to at least give her an idea of what it was like for you know, people that didn't have a lot to balance it. Little, little did they know she was going to bring me home. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, they weren't happy. But you know, I met my wife, and I, I you know, this is this is quite a while ago, but you know, I had a lot of girlfriends at the time. Phenomenally happy, free, little date here, little date there. I run to my wife, I'm like, oh my. God, this may be a problem. <laughs> Sweeps me off my feet. You know, I was, just didn't know what to do about it. So, you know, I'm trying to chase this girl down. And we're going to find out she likes ice cream, you know. So I'm like, hey, value proposition. i got to figure out, you know, she, she loves ice cream. So it's a five-mile drive to Dairy Queen. So how the hell am I going to drive to Dairy Queen to get that ice cream back before it melts? So, you know, one has to go pretty fast down some dark country roads. You know, it's on the way up to Sussex, New Jersey. But you know, I knew that that Dairy Queen would be a big hit right around the end of you know when curfew was in. All our counselors and our friends. So I found out for our counselors what kind of ice cream they like. So I bring ice cream for like eight or ten of these you know these women because you know it's important. The value proposition not only important that you take care of the person you're taking care of, but you want to always take care of the people that they know. So I figured this girl was going to like me. I want to make sure that our friends like me. Oh, you've got to stay with this guy. We need the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, value proposition is important. You know, out of the box thinking. These are all entrepreneurial skills. And that's why I don't, I don't kid you, you know, sometimes to find your girlfriend and find your, your other significant other, you may need to be a little entrepreneur. You know, I mean, I wasn't letting that girl out of my sight. There's no way I'm letting this girl go. Five miles a Derek Queen, no problem. You know, I mean, you do what you got to do. You bring that ice chest. You know, I worked in the kitchen, so. I had access to some, you know, some ice and make sure that the ice came out on ice. So, so, you know, value proposition helped me obtain, you know, the most significant person, which is my life. So, you know, these things all take place, but you know, when you do it with the right amount of energy, you know, when you when you when you want something, you do it with the right amount of energy. At midnight, you know, it's not the, you know, a lot of people say, "Ask midnight." I'm just getting going. I would take a nap, so I'd be up at 11:30 to go get that ice cream. You know, nights when she was on OD. So it's really, really important that you approach this in the right way. And one more example of the passion. A lot of people will come up to me and they'll say, Brandon, you know, how do you have your success? Like, how can I have that? And really what you want to say when you meet somebody that's successful is, how do I go and incorporate the processes that you went through? How can I incorporate those processes? And it's kind of like if life was a fire, you know, if your life was just big burning fire, 
You would say to someone, say, well, how do I get that fire? What I would say is, how'd you make that fire? Where'd you get the wood? Where'd you get the birch? Where'd you get the matches? Where'd you get the newspaper? How, dig the, how, how much did you dig that hole? Put the fire in. How'd you know where to put that fire so you have the right winds, the right angles? And that's the, that's the commitment. The commitment is to go find the best. And then this process and this journey that you're all about to go on is amazing. If you can find comfort and find really excitement in the unknown. You know, when things get really, really shaky, and things get shady, when I get real excited, and then all my people start, whoa, what are we going to do? I'm like, this is exciting, man. Like, we've got to figure this out. If, we, if it was all figured out, we wouldn't need us. Things would just roll. So it's like, you know, when you're building your fire, I don't know what's going to happen when you go in the forest. I don't know if somebody's going to attack you. I don't know if you need to bring some people. I don't know if you need to bring a saw. I don't know if you need, I don't know what you need. I don't know what's going to help build that brightest, brightest fire. But when you're committed to get into the forest and get into building this fire, you'd be surprised what you'll find. And the key thing is, is what's not only going to build your fire, but it's going to build a sustainable fire. No one wants you just to have a little flash of some fire. They want to have a fire that's going to burn for a long time. Which is why I stopped for a minute and say 25 years of something that I had to go tell my mother-in-law at least 50 times exactly what I was doing. And she's, at the end, she I think she got it. You know, I mean, I mean, it's easy for you to say that now. Like, you know, you mentioned about the guest bartenders. I was just going through some old stuff. Like, nobody ever put a celebrity behind a bar. So, you know, in those days, it was, the drinking age was 18. But it's like, in those days, putting a celebrity behind a bar serving drinks was a pretty unique idea. Hiring a player to do appearances to go to golf outings was a completely unique idea. And, and I, I could probably give you 50 different things that we now do as common, you know, that teams now use players for, that I was the first to do that. You know, Q&As before the game, meet and greets with a player after the game, chalk talks with coaches before the game. These are all like unique, unusual ideas. So. Um, it's easy, you know, signing a baseball and selling that. And I, like, that was a unique idea. But it starts with, you know, me being 15 years old. I was 14. I was up in Boston. My mother took me to the Fenway Park, crazy Yankee fan, going crazy amount of games, whatever it's up. So I'm up in Boston, and I realized we're in the hotel. We stayed there always the Sheridans. I always thought the S's on the ashtrays and towels were the Steiner. <laughs> my mother eventually broke the news, like, that was the Sheridan stuff. Thank God, you know. I'm like, oh, we would have done. We all the soap and everything we grabbed out of these hotels. So we get to the hotel, and uh, we're hanging, and I'm like, Mom, i got to go to the game. I think these ball players are running around the lobby. I'm like, i got to go to the game. So we're on tickets for tonight. We don't have money. I got tickets for tomorrow night. I said, I'm going to the game tonight. i got to go. So, you know, I was one of those relentless characters that probably drove my mother crazy. Finally, imagine I'm 14. I'm going to go to the ballpark by myself without a ticket and figure it out. Of course, I scout the ticket. I'm there at the crack of the gates opening. Scout, you know, single ticket sometimes is easy. I'm six rows over the dugout, yelling the Thurman months and like you would not believe. Two hours of just yelling, Thurman, Thurman, Thurman. Nothing. The guy doesn't even turn away and look, nothing. So I come back after the game, phenomenal time in Fenway Park. I mean, just, just, it was probably one of the highlights. I just remember being this. Just being in that ballpark and sitting so close as well. So that's something I normally did. And so I walk in the elevator and this arm holds the elevator door. And he walks there and runs into the elevator. I'm like, oh my God. And he just gets in my face. It's, if you have a new Thurman, he was just a kind of a rugged, rough, but you know, teddy bear kind of guy, but just gets in my face, you know. What do you want? <laughs> Call me my name. You are, you, I mean, what could you possibly want it? I'm like, <laughs> want an autograph. You know, and I just remember, you know, getting that autograph, and then you know, getting a bunch of autographs that weekend when I was there. And I remember that feeling. I'm like, you know, something. Every kid, there's just something about getting an autograph. So I always felt like that was something sellable. And also, I just always wanted. I would search. I mean, everywhere to go find anything that emulated and looked like the players, what they were wearing. If I can get the sweatshirt that the guy was wearing in the dugout, the sweatpants, the sneakers they were wearing, anything to get that stuff. So I always envision, like, if I can get my hands on that stuff. So whenever I would go to players' houses, I'd always go on, you know, I kind of, I always surveyed the players. I was one of the first to do that. I wanted to know what they drank, ate, slept with, 
everything. <laughs> Diseases, you know, they had broken bones, things that their family had. That's really how I got Steiner started, the first company, which was Steiner Marketing before collectibles. And I go in that go in their closets and I would just grab shit. <laughs> so I wanted to play it, I wanted to wear it. You know, so I, you know, what size sneaker are you? I probably need a sample of these. <laughs> so, I, but I, you know, but then when I walk into a meeting, I say, you know, I'm not going to believe this, Tropicana orange juice, but you know, John Starks, you know, he, he drinks like five less of Tropicana a day. Love you. It's the only thing he drinks, really. And I make these connections. I call up companies based on what I see in their closets and try to make these relationships work. And then I created this whole database of hundreds of athletes. I've surveyed, and, and, and at some point I got we got to put this online. But I have all the rejection letters. I sent out like several thousand letters to every athlete that I could possibly think of, asking them to fill out this survey. And it was okay to go to some companies and market them. And I would ask them, "What's your dream endorsement? PlayStation or uh, iced tea or this the cereal company?" And then I would go to these companies and say, "You know, it's a dream for this athlete." work with your company. It's his dream. He told me it's his dream. Like if there's anything you can do besides playing baseball, we'll be able to work with your company. It's like music to your ears. I bring this up because it's going to come up in the job search. And I think it's so important when you're going to look for work, it's music to my ear when somebody walks in and says, it's a dream job if I could have worked with Steiner Sports. Now, we'll get to that in one second. But, you know, so when you think about it, you got to be relentless. You do have to be tenacious. You know, you want to be successful and be entrepreneurial. You need to be tenacious, really, in every aspect. And I think there's two most important ingredients in, 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 that I look for in someone, and that's one is having an incredible work ethic, but also with intelligence. I've seen a lot of people work really hard, and you know, they're idiots. So you know, I'm like, that's great, and you work really hard, but you're working stupid. So you've got to work really, really hard. But you got to work with work really hard with intelligence. And the second thing is, you, know, you have to have a desire to, to be brilliant and, and try for excellence in what you do. There's a third thing that's about being flexible. And this is where a lot of the rubber doesn't hit the road with most of you. You're all in, so you know you got to cancel your Friday night plans, so you can't go to the concerts. So you got to cancel your vacation. I got like three employees aren't hitting their numbers this month. They're about to go on vacation, and they'll go on vacation, even though they know they didn't hit their numbers. Me. I cancel the vacation. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not failing. I'm not a good loser. Show me a good loser, I'll show you a good loser. I mean, I have my numbers, I have my goals, I'm going to hit them, or then things are going to have to come <laughs> off the table. And this is where a lot of people talk about wanting to be successful until it's not going to be. And, you, know, you have to really have to, again, have that desire and that flexibility to really be successful. And the flexibility comes in on a level where, you know, it, inconvenience sets in. And this is where I think a lot of the rubber hits the road for a lot of people where they go off to mediocrity. So if you want to be brilliant, you really want to be good at what you do. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable when you, when you run into a doctor that's so diligent and he's just brilliant. You know that you don't have to worry. Because you know, that guy probably, you know, wasn't, you know, taking weekends off and, you know, going, and you, you know, he's locked in and being the best he could be. And that was his vacation. Flexibility, critical, but work ethic. I mean, you know, I move people when they see somebody really working hard and intelligently. You have those three ingredients, you're probably on the road to success. Great. So back to the beginning of jobs, I'm sure a lot of you probably, how many seniors be out here? Juniors? Sophomores? Freshmen? Graduate students. Great. How many graduate students? Great. So you've been in a general taste of the real world. How many people Googled me before I came? How many people did? <laughs> awesome. Raise them up higher. See, this is the lack of intelligence here that I'm talking about. <laughs> and it's okay. In this day and world, though, to meet anyone in this life, I mean, this is where the rubber, you just, you, you just, you're out of your minds, even if it's somebody coming over your house. It's unbelievable. Like, you'll have family gatherings, and you don't even know half the people sitting at the table. I mean, you know the name. Because you know, there's a person that you, you don't know shit about, <laughs> which is insane. It's not who you know, it's not what you know, but what you know about who. This morning was a train wreck for me because I'm on Opie and Anthony this morning. He was on that show, and these guys are f bombing and, and crazy cursing, and so you know I'm trying to hang in. I'm not a big cursor, but you know I'm 
I'll throw a couple of you know, I'll throw a couple of things <laughs> out there just to kind of be, you know, I'm, I'm there for an hour. I thought it was going on for like 15 minutes. Then I go to Brian Kilme on Fox Business and I say, shit. That was a problem. Like, you know, like all of a sudden I thought like, you know, I thought I was gonna get arrested. Just <laughs> in the room, like, Whoa! Don't say, don't say shit again. You know, I can't say that on the radio. Like, these guys have one, I'm gonna can't say shit. But anyway, it's not who you know, it's not what you know, it's what you know about who. And there is no reason, starting with your professors, starting with your your parents, friends, these are all people that are in your network. I've always been a great inventory taker of everyone that I run across. And those are days before I can just go punch in a name and go. It would have taken you less than three minutes to find out everything you need to know about me. We could have saved the introduction and had five more minutes to talk. At the end of the day, five minutes, you can learn everything about me. You Google Brand Steiner, you get it all quickly. I mean, it's all there. And the reality is that it's almost there now with everyone. It's right out there. I mean, which is something you all should be very concerned about because a lot of you are very sloppy with, you know, with how you receive. You're sloppy on your Facebooks. You're sloppy on your tweets. You think I'm hiring you without getting on your Facebook? You're out of your mind. I'm on your Facebooks. I'm, I'm on your Twitters. Now, I may not get on there, but I other people can get on there. And what am I going to see? Oh, it's great beer, buddy. It's a double A. <laughs> You know, at the library studying. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you may want to think about, you know, what does your image look like? You know, how do people think, you know, how are people going to view you from the outside? How does that look? And there's no way you should meet somebody. Starting with your professors. Like, you think you know your professors? Really? You think this is the only class this, that that's their whole existence? They've all done some incredible things. You'd be surprised what some of them have done previously to teaching your class, outside of teaching your class. And you may all of a sudden find yourself in a quandary between an A and a B and a couple little fraction points behind. And when you ask the professor how his son's doing and how his daughter's doing, you know, and you ask her, you ask the professor how, you know, whatever happened to that side business she had when she invented the da 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 da, you know, that, that's a connection. And people appreciate that because, you know, we just don't want to be another pretty face. So it's not who you know, what you know, but what you know about who. And there's no reason, if you really want to get into the job hunt, you can't afford to meet people and not really know who they are. Next idea. People call me all the time. Now, I'm a great connector, and I do like helping people, but they call me a friend and I, do you know anybody that, you know, is looking for, you know, for, looking for a job? And a big mistake that a lot of you will make is you'll send out a million resumes with a million uh, cover letters and all that stuff. So it's, I, I think it's a mistake. I mean, you can play that angle and your parents will be all over your butts just to get out there so you feel like, you know, sometimes the activity makes you feel like you're doing something. I would say it's activity versus achievement. So, you know, it's like, you can, but it's kind of like this. You have your network of people, the people you've met, from your professors, your parents, your parents' friends, and assuming you're gonna follow my direction here and know a little something about them and building up your database, it's a lot easier to, now you're looking for a job. What are you going to do? Finally decide you probably got to start talking to your parents again. You haven't talked to them in about five years. <laughs> Check in with them. You know, I asked my kid, my kid was going on some interviews last week. I said, Cross, let me help you a little bit. He's back. Why don't you give me a call like in seven years when I actually need your help? <laughs> I'm like, Cross, man, I'm pretty good at the interviewing thing. But you know, you know something you actually learned, you did very well. So it was kind of, he gave me a little bit of a lesson of some of his techniques he used, which is pretty good. So, but at the end, you start talking to your parents. At the end, it's a lot easier to find something when you know what you want. So I always say, take out a white piece of paper <coughs> and look for your dream job. This is a great blog, by the way. If you go to brandonsteiner.com, I did this blog, I think it was about three or four days ago, about really this particular subject matter. But at the end, it's like, well, you want a job, you're looking for something in sports marketing, or you're looking for something in accounting. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. It's, you need to sit down with a white piece of paper and come up with 20 jobs. This is what I would do if I were you. I'd pick out a white piece of paper, I'd look for 20 companies that if all of a sudden a genie bottle came down, I rubbed it, and said, what companies do you want to work for? These are the 20 I want to work for. And I really put some thought to it. Why you want to work for that? Why you want to work for those companies? what you want to do and everything else. Now you got 20 companies. I do a Google alert on all those 20 companies. So anytime anything was written in the media about those 20 companies, 
immediately I get an alert. Then I start researching every one of those 20 companies and learn everything about those 20 companies that there is. And the first thing I want to find out is I want to qualify, right? Anytime you're looking for something, like you're looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend, first thing you want to say is, let's say I'm interested uh, in her, let's say I want to go date her. First thing I want to do is, is she married, she's taken, she got a girlfriend, what, you know, what's the story, right? Qualify. I got to qualify that. So at the end, you're going to find a company that's on the downslope, right? That's actually declining in business right now, not doing well. It's probably not a good company to have on your list. Right? You want 20 companies that are at least vibrant, growing. So I want to look up everything there is about that company. Everything. I want to Google alert them. I want to then go look at the five people that are key people in that company. I want to find anything about that. Oh, Brandon Stein lives in Scarsdale. How's he get to work? What's he done? Family Service Westchester, the Yogi Berra Museum, <coughs> Yankee Stein. I could run into him at the stadium. He's at the PAL. Oh, he's got some charities. I mean, okay. I got a little bit of the landscape here of Steiner Sports. Get the landscape of each one of those 20 companies and to find out the decision makers and what is floating their boat. They, what are they working on? What's new going on at that company? Are they hiring? Are there new products coming into play? Be educational, be knowledgeable. Now you have an idea of what you want and you know a little bit about what you want. So when you go to your inner circle and ask for help, hey, do you know anybody at Steiner Sports that can help me? That's the job I really want. That's my dream job. First of all, when you say something to somebody like, you have to get your dream job? And I know somebody at Steiner, like, I'll help you get your dream job. I'm not just going to help you get a, any old job. And it's amazing how many times people come to me like, can you help me get the da da da? Is that a job you really want? Well, what you get? I'm not really sure. I'm like, people don't want to put themselves out if you're kind of whimsical and not really sure. What people really want is conviction, right? They really want to know that, I mean, everybody just wants to know that they're wanted and be real about it. So that, that's, that's my job search approach. You walk in for the interview. It's amazing how many people walk into an interview with like months of searching and tracking me down and friends calling me up to get the interview. And then you walk in on anything about me or anything about the company. And by the way, I have nothing to do with you because nobody cares about you. So walking into an interview thinking you're going to talk about you and what you've done doesn't really matter. The question is, are you flexible? Do you have a really, really strong work ethic with intelligence? And are you flexible? It's really all that matters. What the hell else? What are you going to do for me? The question is, what do you know about me, and how can you help me? Is my question. And that's what you want to walk into a company knowing. So if you've done the Google works, you've researched the company, you know, you're walking in with some semblance of where you are, and maybe how you can contribute to the success and the direction that the company is going in. That's like a little bit of a better direction if you want to get in the job game. Commitment. Get committed about those 20. Don't get passionate about those 20 companies, but the fact of the matter is you don't know anything about them, really, much. But get committed about it. Get committed you're going to know everything about those 20 companies. So when you walk in, you're sitting in front of me, you go, I've been following your company for two, three years. My favorite companies, my dream. My dream is just to be sitting here. It's an honor. It's a pleasure. You know, when you launched that product, you know, when you came up with a new, that was amazing. Then the community project you did, when you guys donated like $3 million, that was amazing. Particularly with the way you went about I mean, this is what decision makers want to hear. This is like the conversation they want to have. You know what I mean? And then all I got to do is sort out whether you're flexible, you know, whether you have a strong work ethic with intelligence, and are you flexible? Are you flexible? Are you, you going to work on a Saturday when you need to? Big quotes. Simple question. That's like a good way to go get a job. Last, last, last idea, and then I want to do some Q&A with you guys. Last idea. There's a lot to ask for, but I'm going to ask anyway. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up in the morning, I just want you to think of me. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, after I tell you this concept, you're going to be thinking of me about a lot. You're going to be thinking about me a lot when you wake up in the morning. And I'm sure you're not going to be ecstatic about it, but you're going to be like, I was right. He was right. And here's the idea. You wake up in the morning and your whole day is dictated by the first 90 seconds. So you got here, you got 24 hours in a day, and after 90 seconds, you now determine what kind of day you're going to have. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that when you wake up in the morning, the first things that go on in your mind and the conversation you have with yourself, uh, anybody here, everybody here talk to themselves? Raise your hand. Anybody that doesn't? 
<laughs> so we're in agreement with that. I'll talk to ourselves a little bit. I'm a master at it. <laughs> I mean, what? Nobody disagreeing with me. Talking to yourself, there's no interruption. Everything goes the way you want. I fire people, throw people out of the conversation, whatever. It's a beautiful thing. You know? You can make fun of me. You know, like, this is great.